Thank you. I speak three languages, English, Spanish, bueno, Puerto Rican Spanish, and music. Yes, music. This was also my family's language. Not because we could play any instruments or because we could sing, please run away if you hear any of us sing, but because music became the way that we connected and bonded with each other. I was born and raised in Puerto Rico, a place I like to call la cuna de la mejor música del mundo. If you have any Puerto Ricans in your life, you'll know that llevamos la música por dentro. Music lives inside of us. Everything about our social, about our social and cultural interactions revolve around food, rum, and music. Our mestizo identity is a cross-pollination of Taino, African, and Spanish blood, bringing forth a collection of rhythms and sounds and movements that range from bomba y plena to trova, salsa, and yes, of course, reggaeton. I played volleyball for 20 years of my life, so that meant that I road tripped all over Puerto Rico, I traveled to many places in the US, always with the same community of players. And there was one thing that always came with us, timbales and plenas, so that at any given moment you would hear a tun 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 so that you knew that Puerto Rico estaba en la casa. Ever since I can remember, there's been a soundtrack playing in the background of my life. In the 90s, it was Gilberto Santa Rosa in my dad's stereo, it was Ava on my mom's car, Shakira in my sister's boombox, Juan Luis Guerra in my brother's DJ set. Yes, we had a very eclectic taste. I went from NSYNC to Spice Girls to Cat Stevens, Olga Tañón, and of course, the global sensation Ricky Martin in my Walkman later on, later on my CD player, and you know, you get the picture. I grew up in a house that shaped my entire Puerto Rican identity. It felt that I was living in a home with a revolving door with people walking in and people walking out. My parents hosted everything from New Year's Eve's parties to birthdays to hurricane gatherings. They taught us from a very early age the importance of opening your doors to the community and the people that you loved and also to welcome in strangers that later became family. Our home became a target to 4 a.m. parrandas, you know, the Christmas carols, but with the Puerto Rican spice, that ended at 7 in the morning with a sopao, pitorro, and someone always falling asleep on my parents' couch. When I was in eighth grade, they gifted me my first stereo. It was this silver beauty with blue lights, and you can imagine my excitement in the moment that I realized that finally I was going to be able to listen to my music and my CD on my time, and no longer did I have to wait in line to use my family's computer to just open up Napster and listen to music. I had notebooks filled with lyrics, and my dad would often tease me, Mija. If you spent as much time studying for your science test as you do learning these lyrics, you will be a straight-A student. Well, Dad, look at me now. My entire life, I've built relationships around music. I was born, I was born and raised in community, but then you didn't need a label to glorify what came so natural to my parents and my culture and eventually me. I didn't know it then, but this came to shape my entire life. My life has been filled with love and music and, and people that have shaped my entire future. You know, I stand here and I could frankly just romanticize a life that was just that, filled with pure love. But that really would be a disservice to you and myself because my life was also filled with pain and anger and heartache and loss. Life is full of contradictions, and there's nothing in life that teaches us more about this than relationships. We, as human beings, are the epitome of those contradictions, and somewhere along the way, we convince ourselves that life is binary when it isn't. When I was 13, my mom got diagnosed with an immune disease because of an emotional burnout that she suffered. After she had been bullied and emotionally abused in her corporate America banking job, I went from having one mother one day to a person I couldn't even recognize. When you're 13, your ability to manage a situation like this is non-existent. 
her spirit died, and with it, my comprehension of what was going on. I, you know, she went from being the breadwinner of our home and the glue of our extended family to not being able to get out of bed for weeks on end. I got angry, my brother dissociated, my sister got overprotective, or at least that's what I think because we've never actually spoken about it. I lost my ability to communicate properly and to express my feelings in a way that felt productive. I don't remember exactly when it happened, but I promised myself in silence that I would never, ever get burned out. A promise I couldn't keep. After Hurricane Maria impacted us in September of 2017, I started feeling misplaced, disconnected, anxiety. I had eczema all over my head and all over my body. The island was very much still devastated and powerless and with no light to shine. And I didn't know it then, but I was ex feeling exactly that. I felt devastated and I felt powerless and I felt that I had no light to share. I was tired of pretending that living with a generator was normal and I was tired of my colleagues and me pretending that it was business as usual when it wasn't. And I was specifically tired of being Puerto Rican and living there. My dissociation from my community happened fast, in dramatic fashion, and combined a series of events that shook me to my core. A boyfriend that broke up with me over FaceTime. Yes, that happened. We've forgiven him. <laughs> An anxiety attack in an airplane in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Leaving a very successful 10-year career in advertising. Being shamed and judged by people I loved and thought were my friends for leaving that career and selling most of my goods, all within one month. My heart felt heavy and dark, my pain sharp in the mouth of my stomach, my mind was foggy, I, I was nauseous all the time, or at least it felt that way, and I would cry constantly and hysterically often while in hiding. Questions started popping in my head about leaving the island, and. They were like, how dare I leave the place that birthed me? And how dare I leave the place in the middle of chaos? And how dare I leave the people and the place and the community that shaped my entire identity? In my lifetime, I've left Puerto Rico twice. Once when I was 18, because I could and I wanted to for an education. And the second one happened when I was 29, because I had to. You see, I was experiencing what they call in popular psychology a quarter-life crisis. Yes, people, apparently this exists. There's been multiple songs written about this, from John Mayer's Why Georgia to one of my personal favorites, Stevie Nicks' Landslide, a song she wrote while she was undergoing her own. So four years later, as I replay that period of my life, I can clearly see that my identity was changing, yet I didn't have the tools to manage it. So fast forward to 10 months after Hurricane Maria, and I embarked on what Paulo Coelho calls the personal legend in the book, The Alchemist. You know, a person's journey towards their life's purpose. So I had a backpack, I had a journal, and I had a playlist that I titled Songs That Feed My Soul. This last one was my most precious possession, and one that I keep very close. So as I hit play to write these words for you today, I realized that the first song I ever added to that playlist was Stevie Nicks' Landslide, a song I didn't even know was about a quarter-life crisis. So I like to think that that's pretty magical. I quite literally traveled the world for almost a year. I learned how to meditate and do yoga in the middle of the Amazon. I climbed and trekked and camped in the middle of volcanoes and glaciers and mountains. I tried everything from Reiki to energy healing to cacao ceremonies, plant medicine, static dancing, journaling, you name it. I worked at a woman's empowerment foundation in Bangkok. I trained and ran, well, let me be honest, I limped my first marathon. And the best part, my favorite part, was that I spent more than 1,000 hours with people from all over the world, sitting on floors, on patios, on living rooms, sharing stories, breaking bread, exchanging music. I learned about communist Romania. I learned more about apartheid in South Africa. And I even learned about the similarities in the Arab culture with the Latino culture. The lessons around this time were simple, 
yet very life-altering. I was connecting in ways I hadn't in years with people I had never met before. I've never felt more myself than, than this time. They reminded me of my essence, and they reminded me of what my parents and my culture had taught me so many years ago about the magic of living in community. Smaller is always bigger, it's always better, and it's always more personal. This time changed my entire perception of how I see myself. Yes, I am Puerto Rican, something that I wear in my chest every day. And I am also the sum of all these places and people and conversations and music that I've experienced throughout my lifetime. That means that I am multi-layered, multidimensional, multicultural, and multiracial at my core. As such, I am considered a minority for me choosing to live in this country because of the place that I was born. Yet, in 23 years, we'll be living in a minority-majority nation. So that means that our identity, our culture, our music, are the future of this country. And that's our superpower. And don't get me wrong, this has been years in the making. Don't you find it fascinating that you can go from China to Italy in a five-minute walk in New York City? Or how you can go from La Habana to Haiti in a 10-minute drive in Miami? Bueno, if there's no traffic. And how the residents of this island choose to call it Kiwi Spain instead of Kiwi Skane because of how many of you live here. So as I think about the future, and the diversity of, the, of this country and the type of place that I want to live in, one that's inclusive and rich in culture. I cannot help myself but replay the story of my life and my home and my music. You see, because my story is not unique. My story is a mirror to the millions of Hispanic households in this country and in Latin America. This is how we grew up. Yet. Somewhere along the way, we forgot how to connect, the importance of sharing our spaces, and the importance of sharing our stories. Research right before the pandemic was showing that three out of five Americans feel completely disconnected, isolated, and lonely. One of the biggest factors for this, surprise, surprise, is social media, a tool that was designed to do the exact opposite. Yet here we are. So you know what that means? That means that 30 people in this room right now, sitting right here, are feeling exactly that. And believe me, I sympathize because I was there three years ago. But how much more disconnection and isolation and loneliness do we have to feel to react? When and where do we draw the line? Community is not about the number of Discord channels that we are a part of, and it's definitely not about the number of followers that we have on Instagram and TikTok. And it's definitely not about the number of WhatsApp groups that we're a part of, which, by the way, it's too many. The joy of community comes from the, one, the unexpected one-on-one -on -one conversations with someone about their dreams to be an artist. The joy of community comes from introducing my best friend to someone I met while traveling the world, then they meet, fall in love, and get married two months ago. The joy of community comes from sitting in someone's living room to go watch a live music performance by someone that you've never met, you've never heard, yet their story, their music, bring tears of joy to your, to your eyes. When I think about the future and what my vision is, is a place where we can open doors for each other, where we can spark conversations and break bread and experience music and the arts in their purest form. Live, in real time, through people, with a very personal touch. As I think about the future, I want to turn homes into cultural epicenters through the arts where we as people become the curators and the promoters of what culture is, where our worlds collide and we help each other thrive. Now, this vision has been two years in the making. After 220 concerts and more than 6,000 fans attending some of these uh, incredible experiences, we're connecting real people with each other, music lovers with incredible talent that hasn't been tapped yet. So, 
community is not about the number of interactions that you had today. Community is about the quality of those conversations. And community does not need a label. It needs committed individuals like you and me that choose to show up over and over and over again to be there for each other and help us thrive. So again, as I think about the future of this country and the type of world that I want to live in, my commitment to you and to myself is to build a place where my village is your village and where mi casa is tu casa. So what's your commitment? Thank you.